Good morning.、Um, thank you for coming back this Saturday. And、uh, today I'm going to talk about a little bit of、um, the advanced optimization. And then after that,、um, for the afternoon session, I'm going to talk about the convolutional neural network.、Uh, so for、uh, this lecture, it's probably a lot of math. So、uh, maybe the formula is intimidating, but、uh, if you think it's too much, just raise your hand, yelling at me, okay? Um, so let's get started. So last time,、um, some student asked me that whether there are some、uh, optimization optimization method to adjust the learning rate automatically, or we have to adjust manually, right? So there are a bunch of algorithms.、Uh, at least I have four here. There must must be a lot out of、uh, what I have now. So I will just introduce them to you.、Uh, it will be helpful for you to tune your model. Um, let's get started. So here's the four、uh, optimization algorithm I'm going to talk about today: the Atom Grad, as RMS Prop,、um, Atom Data, and Atom.、Uh, so pretty、um, famous, useful. So、um, some intuition why I'm going to introduce this、uh, optimization algorithm because think about this way: if now we have like two variables that we want to update. Like、w1 and W2, and now we have the unified learning rate on those eta, and so、uh, we upgraded with their own gradient, so which can be of different scales. Maybe some gradient will be close to zero, some gradient can be super large to infinity, and that's why when we update those weights,、um, we can be diverged for different、uh, dimension. And that's why we are trying to introduce、uh, the first algorithm, the Adam Grad,、um, which will try to eliminate the problem that caused、um, the unified learning rate problem. So we use a special、um, vector here. It's called a community variable, the ST, and which is the sum of square of all the previous mini batch gr stochastic gradient. So the math formula will be like this. On the st,、uh, so l star is at zero. So at zero, we will initialize it to be zero, and then at st, we will then first sum up the current gradient, which is like jt o dot jt, and then we plus it back to the previous sum up of st minus one. So we use that to update our st every time, and、uh, here the delta o,、uh, which is here. It's the symbol for、uh, element-wise multiplication, so multiplies element-wise one by one. So how do we use this st? Because think about this way: if the gt is super large, then when you add them together, the st will be super large too, right? And then we'll use this large number、uh, as a denominator, and then get the square value for them to divide the learning rate. And use that as a new learning rate to update、uh, our gradient. So we use that on、um, the new learning rate, O dot to the current gradient, and use this new value to update the current x t minus one. And、uh, here、uh, the learning rate is still pretty small, and that's epsilon here. You see in the denominator, it will try to. Um, maintain the numerical stability. So think about this way: if you get no gradient all the time from j zero to j t, then this s t will be zero. But we don't want to divide some zero value, right? So that's the、uh, um, basic intuition for that. So this is the first formula. You will just need to remember this. You don't need to remember actually. You just need to understand this、uh, to math formula.、Um, any question before I go into the next one? Okay, uh, then atom grad also have some problem. What is the problem? If you sum up all the st,、uh, all the jt square or jt o dot jt, and sum up them together, then what if the current jt ex exponentially grow, and it's super large? It's even larger than all the sum up for the previous st minus one, which also can lead to a diverge, right? So that's why. On the RMSP, RMS prop will help. So what is it? It will just update、um, the ST using a different way. It using the AWMA, which is exponential weighted moving average, 
And uh, we have this hyperparameter gamma here. And this gamma is between 0 and 1. And we're trying to update, uh, apply this gamma value to all the previous on. So we have different weight for the current RJT, O.JT, and the previous sum of ST minus 1. So if the current JT dot o, o dot JT is pretty large, but we don't take off them, right? We only take one minus gamma of them. Maybe if the gamma is equals to 0 0.9, then this JT dot JT will be pretty small. And then we're trying to eliminate the diverge problem. So similarly, uh, our expansion, why are we doing the AWMA here? Uh, why it's called AWMA? It's kind of the exponentially growth. Um, for those gamma, so it's like one and the gamma plus gamma square, etc. Um, but it will equals to the one over one minus gamma. So it's like this uh, super amazing mass formula. So that's like uh, the basic idea why it's called moving a weighted moving energy, but it's exponentially grow. So if we plug this st back into our learning rate, it's still using the similar function uh, update as Adam grad. Um, but this ST is just a calculate using a different way. Um, and so here's a little bit update for uh, the RMS prop. Um, we have this uh, new ST, which is different to Adam grad, but using the similar formula of update. So I'm not uh, too scared, right? <laughs> Any question? OK, maybe it's too early <laughs> to ask question now. <laughs> So um, the next step is atom data. So what's it different? Um, actually, it's using the same um, weights, EWMA weights, like the RMSP prop um, for the updating. But now we're just using a, a different no nomination parameter here. Uh, counter to, it will counter, be compared to the gamma in the RMSP prop. Um, but similarly, when we update on the ST using EWMA, um, but the difference is like the atom data will maintain an additional state, which is the delta xt. And what is this element? It will be useful to update the current gradient. So the current gradient may be still too large, and maybe we want to measure some variation of the independent variables. So that's why we want to measure this delta. And we also plug the epsilon on the nominator and denominator to maintain some numerical stability. So here is the um, GT prime. And we're going to use that GT prime to, to update on our weights. Um, but we also need to update this delta. Since remember, um, this delta is used to calculate the JT prime in the previous formula. So we need to update every time step. And this um, delta will also be a EWMA formula. Probably people just like the EWMA, the moving average. Um, we also have this like update for each JT prime, O dot the JT prime, to, which is to capture the var variation of the independent variables. Um, yeah. So to sum up, the atom data will have four formula now. Uh, the first one, similar as the RMSP prop, but it has its new JT prime, and it, it will use this JT prime to update on the ST. Any questions? Any comments? That is too many mass. No? OK. So the next one probably is um, mostly uh, worldly used one. It's called Adam. So what is Adam? It combines the RMSP prop with momentum. So in addition to the decay of average of the past of all the square uh, gradient, we also used a decaying average for the past gradient. So we have the two terms. Uh, which all, both of them are following the EWMA, which is um, the weight T, the mo momentum variable. It will be updated using the previous momentum variables and the current gradient using this beta one. And we also have uh, like this ST, which is using beta two 
um, with the EWMA formula to update this XT um, with the GT O dot GT. So pretty simple, just using WA to update the current two variable. Um, but sometimes if the T is too small, we probably need to do some bias correction. And that's why you will see this new two formula here. And why is that? Because if you think about that, if now you're at the stage one and your beta one equals 0 0.9, and your V1 will be then 0 0.1 times the current gradient G1. Um, but then it will be super small, right? Compared to like the other gradient weights. So we want to kind of do a little bit adjustment for the bias. So we divide it by the total sum, which is um, one minus um, beta one to the power of t. So which like if the first step to the power of t is like a one minus like the, this 0 0.9, it will be 0 0.1. So you, you divide this 0 0.1 back to that, it will just coming back to the original gradient. So like all the gradient for the previous time step, like all the term for the pre previous time step will add up to one in total. And you won't say that too small term to large term. So similarly, uh, algorithm will be uh, apply for the bias uh, correction for the ST hat. So you get this VT hat, ST hat, it's just like a bias correction to remove some bias. So, uh, after you have those two, um, VT hat, ST hat, you can plug in your good to fly. So you have this um, J prime as before, you have this learning rate times the VT, which is we just calculated, and divided by the square root of ST hat plus this epsilon for um, numerically sp stabilities. And you update the final ST using the JT prime. So not that hard, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, any questions, comments? Um, by the way, I already posted slides on my GitHub if you want to take a look. Okay, um, so if we don't have questions, I will continue with um, convolution neural network, which will be this morning and this afternoon's main oh yeah. Honestly, this one is a bit too fast for me. <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. Yeah. So can can you give me some intuition for each optimization method? Like, why do we have like four optimization method like either grad, I'm um, prop, Ada Delta, or Adam? And I'm pretty sure that all of this has some kind of hyperparameter to tune, right? So <coughs> what is your suggestion for each and which one is the best for which situation? Because I think it's not good for which any situation, right? I see, yeah. yeah. Um, that's like three question for me. So the first question is like, I'm going too fast. So do you guys want me to go over again or? <laughs> No, <laughs> probably not, right? Okay. The second question is like, uh, why we are using this two optimization? Why we just do not use in the uh, original one, right? Um, as, what I, as what I said, it's like, think about this way. We have um, this universe, universal learning rate that's being applied for each of the ways. So think about you have 10 dimensions. And each of the dimension will have different gradient towards different vectors. And so they will, their gradient will be with different scale. They might be super close to zero, like 0 0.001 for the gradient. And you still apply the learning, similar learning rate to adjust your weights. But sometimes you might have like a learning rate pretty huge. It's like close to infinity. And then your weights will kind of diverge, right? So even though all the other dimension find the correct gradient, that if one is wrong, then it won't work. 
So that's why we want them, all of them to keep in the same scale. That's why we want to adjust this learning rate a little bit. Um, in the formula formula, you can see like the atom grad adjust it by divided the sum. Because if it's too big, we can divide it to make it small, right? So this is a basic intuition. Um, and the last question is like, how do we choose over this four formula? Um, so for me, why use use the, the this for them or the, the optimization? Most of the time, we use atom since um, probably it's the most share of art version. And as you can see, it combine all the previous advantages for this atom since probably it have more a formula and have more biased corrections and. It, um, it also combines all the AWMAs, um, exponential weight smooth average. So it combines all the kind of advantages to one algorithm. And that's why, um, especially when I heard research talking about it, the state of art research, or like in production, people usually use the atom. Yeah. For the atom, I'm not quite sure if they have something like decay rate because I think it has the EDBMA inside, right? The decay rate, you mean? Because in the EDBMA equation, we have something like, uh, we have to decay the... Yeah, 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 you mean we need to tune ourselves like this beta one did beta two? Yeah, that's the painful part that even though it helps you to remove your bias, you need to tune something now. <laughs> Uh, that's why why those machine learning engineers are sitting there for tune the parameters, right? <laughs> Good question. Uh, any other question before I switch to? Oh yeah, there's one back there. Hi, uh, my question is just gen general one. Uh, yesterday there was a slide on machine translation um, and uh, versus uh, neural network. I just want to ask uh, what is the uh, theoretical and uh, technical success? For example, still it's uh, uh, in practice um, uh, machine translation with machine learning, not the success rate uh, with the um, neural networks, why is still, uh, in theory, it states that I have gone through for maybe for English and for other parallel corpora, there is a success rate where parallel corpora exist, but for the low resource languages, there is a uh, lower uh, success rate. Where would you see in the future? Uh, so if I understand correctly, it's like, you're saying that for some of the language between two pairs translation is yeah. successful already, but for the um, others, but 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 that uh, the paper you were referring it was just for the sentences, just for test case application data set was so small, it was not for like going through the pages or going through the website. We don't have a single ap application where we can say this is a website of three hundred pages and it's use it it's using. Uh, uh, it has used this neural network and it has translated instantly to all uh, to the mm, machine translation uh, for uh, for maybe 10 languages or maybe 20. I don't see anything. Oh, okay. So you think that there's no universal for models to do the mo model translations, right? So, um, so for the NLP problem, it's a little bit tricky because now when people are doing it's like do lots of labeling. Think, think about that. If we want to machine to do the uh, language translations, we need some linguistic or need someone who is bilingual to translate ourselves, to label the data, right? Or how does the machine learn? And uh, for maybe the major language or maybe like the language which have more labeler to label it, they will already have a large data set and we can train on them. But if we don't have um, a really good data set, a large data set, then deep learning won't work. So that's why for deep learning, the first rule is that you get enough data and they're qualified data. So um, for your question, I believe the majority of the model is universal, but it just we don't have enough data set, like for maybe different pair of language. 
Yeah. Thank you. But I, I feel like for the foreseeable future, if we do have languages, we will just have everything using deep learning. Yeah. OK. Um, so let's get started with convolutional neural network. Um, so here is a basic outline for this morning and this afternoon. We are going to talk about the most um, basic architecture for convolutional neural network, also called CNN. And the first is convolution. So the first is convolution, uh, and then we're also going to talk about pooling, padding, strat, uh, multi-layer. Um, and I'm also going to introduce some famous um, architecture for CNN like the LINET, the AlexNet, the VGG, the ResNet, and also some other ideas I will mention, but I won't introduce the architecture. Uh, if we do have time, I would like to. So um, let's get started. So why we are considered this convolution? Why we don't just using the dense layer? So think about now, um, we all have a, um, a camera, a good camera, then for RGB image, it will be 36 million of elements in one image. And uh, the model size for the single hidden layer MLP with only just one layer and 100 hidden size unit in it. So the parameter will be 3.6 billion parameter you need to train if you want to train MLP with this net. So how we get those numbers? So now we have the input layer, which is uh, 36 million features. You can think about 36 million of uh, pixel. And then you have the 100 neuron in the hidden layers. And then if you want to train the edge, uh, edge which are like here, all the arrow here, then you will time them together. It will be 30, uh, 3.6 billion parameters. And uh, that's like 14 gigabyte in memory which is pretty large number if we just train one MLP. So that's why we want to solve this problem. So how do we reduce the number of weights? Can we do some tricks on that? And that's the convolution neural network coming in. So for example, now in this photos, we're trying to find where's Waldo. You can say like maybe most of them are Waldos besides trees. And they show them Waldos, then how our model can work to just classify one model or maybe two model. So there are two principles we can learn from um, these uh, pictures. So the first is translation invariance, which means for our eyes, our vision system, that we should respond similarly to the same object, um, no matter where it is. So maybe like the left-hand side is a model, the right-hand side is a model. So it doesn't matter where is it, our visual system will recognize it. So this we call it translation environments. And the second principle is locality, which means that for one world, it is a world, it doesn't depend on the other world. Um, if it's where a red hat, like with this uh, red and white, then um, it's a world, it doesn't really depend too far compared with a local region. So, um, Keep in mind of this principle, and we'll use this to derive some mass formula. Um, so what are we going to do? Firstly, we will shape the input x and uh, uh, the hidden layer, the output h, to a matrix. So think about now we have the x as a vector, which is like uh, 36 million of parameters there. And this h is also a like, huge um, parameter outside. So we want to shape the reshape them to a matrix. So you shape a vector to a matrix, it's just like algebraic uh, reformulations. And then we also want to reshape the weight. Uh, shape the weight, which is the weight now is like a square matrix. We want to shape it to a 4D. So why is 4D? Because the input now is like 2D. And then we need to kind of compromise this 2D in the calculation, right, in this KL. We need to sum up everything together um, for this KL. That's why we need this like 4D dimension. And this ij will come back to this um, hi, which is your output. So 
what the next step? Um, we can replace this VIG AB um, with from this W. Why we won't do that? Because it just like algebraic uh, reformulation reshape. It's not um, some really um, understanding trick. It just reshape like re-index everything. Uh, so it's a bit complicated, but if you trying to draw it using some square, some vector yourself, you will find out like it doesn't really matter what, how do you call this index. So after we get this formula with this weight index, and uh, we will take our first principle, which is a translation variance. Um, and we assume that a shift in X should simply be a shift in H. So which means that if we shift on this IJ, then the H should be different. But actually, um, in the Waldo case, our vision system taught this is not the truth. Like in, if we shift our input from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, it probably still can be a Waldo. So this weight won't change in your visual system. It, your visual system will still have this weight to recognize this Waldo. So probably we can simplify this um, weight term a little bit. Maybe it has too many indices now. So what we can do, we can just remove the AB because, or uh, just remove the IG because IG elements doesn't really matter. It doesn't really tell us anything. So um, we have this formula. Oh, sorry, I should re uh, remove this AB. Um, but we have the new formula with um, the HI. And uh, you can think about this way. We'll suddenly reduce the dimension from 36 million, 36 million times smaller because usually it's like IJ, it will be for each of the pixel, which is 36 million for the input. And now we remove this IJ, we replace everything with this VAB, this new term. So that's why it's like 36 million times smaller. Pretty amazing, right? So um, let's go to the second idea, which called the quality. Uh, we just find like the model shouldn't depend on its neighbors, right? So when we calculate the model, we shouldn't really care about um, maybe too far from it. So how do we use this principle? So if we, if some A and B that we sum up here um, for this output value to recognize as a Waldo, if this A and B is too far from the current Waldo location, and maybe it's too far, it's like on the left-hand side here, so probably we won't consider of it. And we will set all the weights V here, V A B, to be at zero. So it will turn the first formula to the second one here, which is uh, H I J. Well, equals to within some range submissions of like A and B um, within this delta range. And then we sum up this um, V A B and X I plus A and J plus B. So um, before I come to the models, any questions? So basically, if you write in terms of ma uh, matrix, uh, let's say matrix vector multiplication, so H would be some vector W times X, for example, right? And then, um, so by imposing these two properties, you would basically, that's basically would amount to imposing some structure on, on this W, on the weight matrix, kind of. So, Is uh, that the right intuition, or I, I'm trying to get the intuition. Yeah. So, so usually when you write H equal W times X, mm -hmm. W could be anything for the dense yes. layer. Yes. So now you want to impose this translation invariance and localities. Yes. Could you maybe give us a little bit of intuition how this structure in W would look like for this? It's you mean the new W? Yeah, the, new, the new W, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> Um, the problem is that, like previously, we have such a large um, weights, and uh, probably it's super huge, and we cannot write it down. And what is the new W look like? So the new W will be like this way here that we just replaced. 
I believe it's this, um, this rate index formula that I, I state here, that we have this, so this is just some linear algebra trick. We re-index everything because we reshape the input from a vector to like um, a square matrix. And then we also reshape the output. But think about that, for each element in this output, like if, if this H is a vector, and each element in this output, it only depends on the weight matrix row and your input X vectors, right? So it won't depend on the other thing. So even if we reshape it to some IJ, we can still go back to find that row. Maybe it's not a row now. Maybe it's like um, four row from this 4D tensor, but we can still extract it. And similarly for X, we even though we re reshape it to like some matrices, but then we can still like know that whether if it's a matrices, we can still know that where is originally come from, right? Because we reshape it, we know where it's come from. And we can uh, memorize, or the model will memorize this like KL. And if we do some uh, mass algebra, I believe it's like, if you, for example, uh, cut this X to half, and then it will be uh, K minus one times the, the height uh, over two, and then plus it back the original rows index, and it will be the original like X uh, index. So um, I would suggest if you like want to understand intuitively of how this like relationship work, just like write it down, draw some square and do some calculations and maybe just aim on one element and then you will feel like it's just like some relationship. So not too hard. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I and Jay are referring to the indexes of each pixel, right? And so what do A and B um, referring to? So, hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So you can think about A and B, like in this case, it will be some format from this K and L. So previously, or can I draw it somewhere? So uh, I just reshift this vector here and just reshift to like n by two. So now suppose we have this original vector which is x here and which has the row of like two n times one, um, which is a vector. And we reshape it to this uh, r n times to two matrices. So for each element here, it will be any element in this matrix, right? And so for example, you have this i i's element, which is a fourth element after the n's one. And then it will be reshaped, for example, to be here, which will be, um, which will be have the index, which is equals to one over two. And this will be some kind of a, b here that you are trying to reshape, but this a, b is always coming back to this i. So if you reshape, you know what, how much times do you cut, maybe you cut four times, you know, like to four, like, matrices, like one, two, three, four. So you will still remember it. So for this two AB, 
as long as you know where is this i is coming from, like if this i equals to n plus one, and you reshape it to some like n times two matrices, then it will always come to there. So you always like refer back to it. It's like one-to-one -one mapping. Yeah, and similarly for h, similarly for w. Yes. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, so um, after we have just two um, foundation formula, we are going to come into the real case, the convolutional um, formula. So let's start with the 2D convolution first. Um, we also call it cross-correlation because it's really some cor cross-correlation element-wise um, multiplication with each other. So what are we going to do is like we have the formula that we just derived here within this um, delta range and we have this um, um, weight matrix which is can sum of square have like some um, super small value rather than the huge intermediate value. And what are we going to do? Is we can apply these weights and on those matrices to get some um, multiplication endwisely for this formula. So how do we explain it in math? Here's a super simple example. And um, for the input, I have a three by three square matrix. And for the kernel, I have a two by two. So the kernel is the weight we're just trying to reduce it for. And it's a weight for the convolutional neural network. And we usually call it kernel. It's like simple. Uh, square matrices or maybe other matrices for different dimensions of input. So how do we calculate it? For example, for this output, which you can think about as h, and the first element of h is 19. How do we do that? We times each of them element-wisely um, to each other, like the first one, 19. We have like 0, which is coming the first input times to the kernel, and 1 coming from the input times the kernel, etc. And we sum up together, we get this 19. Similarly, for all the other three elements here, we have this like 25 then, which means that this um, kernel um, square will slice right a little bit. So it won't be um, like shaded on this 0, 1, 3, 4 matrices. It will be shaded on this 1, 2, 4, 5, this 2 by 2 squares for the input. And you can see like this 1, 2, 4, 5 here. And you're also using the same kernel to calculate output 25. OK, so here's like intuition here on the right. And uh, so to generalize it, we have this input um, x, which of an h times an w chip. And we also have this kernel w, which ha have this kh times kw chip. And uh, we do like those multiplication with each other and slide it on the right and do another multiplication. So the new shape for the output, um, which is y here, is an h minus kh plus 1 and times nw minus kw plus 1. So this is a new shape for your uh, output. So how do we get that? For example, if we have this 3 by 3 as input, 2 by 2 as kernel, and then our output is 2 by 2, right? So it's like an h equals to 3 and kh equals to 2. So 3 minus 2 plus 1 will equal 2, which is the height of the output uh, of the output. Similarly, for the weights, we do the similar trick. And the formula here is kind of on um, the vectorized closed form or uh, not closed form version for um, the W star with X. And this W and B, which are weights and bias a uh, learnable parameter that we're trying to tune using our convolutional neural network. And uh, some examples of those kernels, why we use this kernel on, on our image. So we ha I have this like three um, kernel, uh, edge kernel, or probably different size of kernel, noise kernel, 
that we're trying to apply on these photos. And so here is some, um, first is edge detection, um, maybe like white and black. And the second is you are sharpening the photo a little bit by this a minus and a positive value here and this zero here. And the third is some like blow function. You add a lot of noise to it to blur the function a little bit. So this is like the basic idea of the kernel. It like, try to extract different kind of information like the edge, like the sharpen, um, etc. And also for different um, um, different size or different shape, different um, looks of the the kernels, you will apply differently for the same photos. So we have the original photos here, and we have two kernel on the right. And this will be their output. They're pretty similar, but you can see that on the right kernel, you have this um, white and black. And you can see on this cloud here, there are some ad white and black edge, which is recognized by this kernel uh, itself rather than the other one. There's like no that much um, cloud being recognized here. And uh, so we can run the convolutional neur neural network notebook uh, later. But before I run that, does anyone have the installation done ready? Anyone have it finished overnight? Well, any problem? Is that because some like limit increase so you cannot open the server? Um, so if not, so uh, if no one really done it, I, I can demo it this afternoon, like how to set up on AWS. It, it will be pretty simple, straightforward, but will help you to get handy, get your, uh, get your hand like dirty, dirty easily for to run in the neural networks. So it's pretty easy, uh, pretty, pretty important to get you start. And oh, be before I talk about that, any questions for convolution? Okay, so then I will talk about some tricks for convolution neural network. So the first is padding and strat. So the um, intuition here is why we are using this padding. So for example, um, I gave you this shirt image, which is 32 by 32. And if you apply the convolutional layers with like five by five kernel, then after seven layers, your final photos will be super small. It can still be uh, close, but it only have four times four pixels, um, which is pretty small, and we don't really want that. And which means that we lost, we may, we may lost a lot of information during our processing. So what we can do, oh, by the way, this is the shape um, for after you apply the, um, the convolutional kernels that we just talked about. So what we can do for that, we can pad uh, on the image edge. So think about that. When, you, uh, when we apply the kernel and slide over image every time, we might only uh, get the information from the edge one time, right? Like for example, this um, zero here like um, that I'm pointing to, it only be called one time when the kernels first start here. But the other thing, like this four here, it can be slide and be calculated and be mapped to the output at KPS value for four more times, which is um, four more times weighted compared with the first pixel. But we don't want to lose information from the edge pixel. Maybe they're important. So that's why we kind of do a little bit of padding here. We pad a little bit zero here because zero won't change anything. And we're using the new padding input and the time with our kernel. So you think, so you think like the new input here, we only have the original information, which is zero, um, but the other is what we pad, they're just noise. And we times it, we can still keep this zero here, which is pretty important. And uh, um, so similar as what we do for the 2D convolution, we have this zero times zero, plus zero times one, plus zero times two, plus zero three, it goes to zero. So you apply this on um, element wise eight times with each other. And the intuition here on the right hand side is still similar as previously, is you just have uh, 
one more layers or maybe several more rows columns outside the original image with zero. So here's a shape uh, of your output matrix after we pad them with um, the padding pH and the PW. So the height will be NH, which is original input, minus the KH, which is the kernel height, and plus this padding, um, which we'll assume this padding will include both on the top and on the bottom, and then we plus one because um, this is one that we left before. And uh, some tips and common choice for this pH, it, you already be, it definitely will be smaller than your kernel, or your kernel will be not working on your edge if like you're padding too much noise on that. It doesn't know, mean anything, right? So you already we padded with this pH equals 2kh minus one. And uh, for old kh, we already pad like pH divided by two on both sides of your image. And then for even cage, we were to put the setting on the top and maybe on the floor, on the bottom. Just a little bit of trick to keep your mind. Um, but the issue for padding here, it's maybe too slow. For example, now, if I have a big image, I want to reduce the size to be a small one quickly. I cannot do it. Maybe I need like super a lot of like uh, convolutional layers, maybe seven or ten layers um, to reduce its size. So can we make it faster? So what we can do is we can use um, the stride here. So stride is doing is like previously we sliding uh, over one pixel at a time, but now we're trying to slide with multiple pixel. So this multiple pixel can be two or three or whatever is so greater than one. So in this case, um, on the right hand side, it's like stride with three for height. So for the height of original input, every time we slide it, we jump three pixel rather than jump one as before. And those calculation will be, you can see um, on the example here, we have the zero, zero, six, zero, and we have times with the kernel, um, uh, and uh, it will be just the second element. So it will just neglect all the other squares um, before it, and then just time is up after this three, three step jump. And so here's the ship of the, after you apply in the strat on your um, convolutional layers. So here is a output ship, which is an H minus KH, plus um, pH, so this is as previously, but we want to plus this SH as, this SH divided by SH will be one, so it's like the previous one in the, all the previous shape. But now, since we are jump every time, and we are di di um, divided them by this SH. And some tricks here. So if we have this pH equals to the kernel, size on uh, kernel height minus one. And similarly for the um, um, PW, we can have the output at the setting. So plug in this formula to the before, and we have the um, middle formula, which is NH plus SH minus one divided by this SH, and we choose the um, floor of it. We don't want to choose the setting because think about that if we, we come to the end and there is only two pixels left, but we want to jump three pixels. So we have some information that the kernel cannot catch that we don't have the information. So we just um, don't, just we don't want to keep this value, we just throw it out. And uh, sometimes if the input height and width are divisible by your stride value, so you can divide well uh, exactly, then the output side will just to be NH divided by SH uh, times with NW divided by SW. So that's it. Um, any question for polling and strat? Is everyone good with it? How, what time, how much time left? 20, 25, okay.
So um, I will run the Jupyter mod book later, and um, after we talk more about it. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. By the way, I have post on uh, all the slides on um, PDF online. So on my GitHub, which is the same as the repo for the installation link, so you can you guys can all access it. Yeah. So you don't need to really re uh, remember this, but sometimes when it returns you some error, you probably need to do some little bit calculation, especially when you're debugging it. Uh, it will be important. But nowadays, most of the uh, package will do it for you. Like for MXNet, it will just automatically calculate the shape for you, so you don't do it by hand. Okay, um, let's continue uh, with this multiple input and output kernel uh, channel. So, some integration for here. It's like back in 1970s, there's not really a lot of uh, colorful pictures. Mostly people have like this. Um, black, white, and gray. So it's now the RGB channel. Um, but back then, there's a really interesting photos from this model. And uh, why research are really interesting to this photo? Because it has a lot of texture that we can extract from it. Um, it has the smokes here. It has this texture on its head. And it has its background with its architecture. It's a bit blur. So a lot of interesting thing that the researcher want to capture from this picture. And uh, what's more important is like, because it's a colorful picture, it uh, has RGB three kernels, which is red, green, and blue. And uh, compared with the grayscale um, pictures, which lost a lot of information, this one has much more, which means it has three input channels, um, the red, green, and blue. So why we want to use that? Um, think about that now. Um, the example here has two channels, um, which are two square matrix coming in. And what we're going to do, pretty simple, we just have two kernels for both of them. We apply on them, slide, um, maybe padding, strat, do the similar things on it. And we get this um, input times kernel will equal to this output. But please remember, whatever we're going to do uh, in the last step is we pl plus their um, sum up in. So you can see here, it says like the first input is one, two, four, five, and then says the kernel one, two, three, four. Then we element-wise multiply them for the first uh, input channel, and we do the same thing for the second input channel, and then we get their first element. And we will just sum them together to be 56. And so here's a generalized formula that we have this x as input with multiple channel. You can see that previously the input is only nh times nw. And but now we have maybe three channel or two different channel. We have to say i. And uh, for the weight, w since we have the say i, the current each of the kernel will apply on each of the channel. So we have the say i different kernels. And we have the Y, which will be our MH and MW by your define. So what are we going to do for this Y, H element? Well, it goes to all the CI sum up together, with all the kernels sum up together, and with all the previous kernel apply on your input. And uh, before talking about the multi multiple output channel, any questions? Am I too fast? Okay, so, so far we have already got the single output channels, which only single one matrix as output. Can we do more on the output channel? And the answer is yes. So, just change a little bit here. We have this um, sale here as the output channel. So the other terms are pretty same and the multiple input. And this weight, what we have, we just we will have a different way to generate different output channels. Right? It's like, for example, you have two input channel, and then you will have CI equals to two. And if you have three output channel, which for example, if you will output another 
um, RGB um, image. So the output channel will also be three, right? So you also have like this three times on your weights. So still similarly, um, this YI will can be relying on the same on the previously multiple input channels formula, but we will need to calculate each YI for each of the output since we don't want them to combine together. We want each of the channel output to be independent of each other. And uh, some intuition of uh, where are you using multiple input channel and oh, okay. So these are some um, picture that I showed you before, uh, which we are doing the stereo transfer using MXNet, that we can transfer the original image to different style of image. And that's how we do it. We have our multiple output channels and we train differently. And they will have some different ways in the kernel and they apply it so it will be the output. Pretty interesting. And if we apply different kernel um, for the image, it can be like a horizontal kernel, it can be a vertical kernel, it can be um, recognize the shape or recognize the edge, etc. So if we apply multiple things um, once, we will get different um, recognition features that we want to recognize this. Either we want to do classification or maybe regression, or maybe not regression. <laughs> Uh, so this is a um, major summary where we're doing that. Uh, and the intuition of why we are using this one times, nine, one times one convolutional layers is that it seems ridiculous that we are not really do anything because it's like one by one convolution. It just apply on one pixel it seems does it not recognize any spatial patterns over a whole pictures. But what it do is like it try to fuse the different channel dimensions. So for example, our input channel has a three dimension here, as I say, and we have this um, three by two, one, uh, three times two, one by one uh, convolutional kernels. And so what I'm going to do, we're trying to reduce this on three input channel to two output channels. So what we're going to do is like, for the first channel on uh, this three square here, we times multiply them elementwisely with the first element of all this input channel. So it will be the first element here on the output. And similarly, all the other, other element will calculate for different channel. Um, any questions? So it means one by one convolution, convolution layers, it is it to uh, reduce the number of, of layers, not, not layers, the number of channels, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. Can it be increased the number of channels? Yes, yes, definitely you can do that. It just like to fuse, to change. Uh, dif the dimension of number of channels. So it will happen a lot in the later when you introduce more at once neural uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, mm -hmm. We are tr sometimes uh, trying to increase the channel from maybe the current 10 one to 100. So just uh, tr try different side because for different kernel, it will recognize different thing. And we want to keep all of them because maybe some of them are useful for us. That's why we want to have different, maybe 100 channel, maybe 255. Uh, 256 um, channels, yes. All right. But for the padding and stripe, it's, it's to reduce the size of the image, right? So it's different dimensions, If can I say that? Yeah, yeah. So, mm, so the channel is like, you see there is like two here, it's like two mm -hmm. channels, so it's like, uh, has some three D um, feeling, but mm -hmm. for the padding and strat, it's only applied on this two D, so it's applied only on this square. Right. So in this square, you do the padding, but you will do the same padding for each of the channel, or 
they are not fair, right? You, you cannot have one of your child go to the private school, you cannot have the other child go to the public school, right? Yeah, uh, to uh, for, for to add on his uh, question. Uh -huh. So just um, just uh, want to make sure that so uh, it means that from what you're saying that uh, for padding you have to do for every channel, right? And for for doing this by doing this do 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 it only one time. Is that the the benefit of this? Uh, like, so your question is whether we only do one time for this one by one convolution. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, no, because um, this one by one convolution happens a lot in the later, like Google Net, uh, they do inceptions or ResNet later. So they apply this um, one by one after they do a lot of convolution with like the, the normal convolution, and they apply this one by one channel to maybe change the different uh, size of the channel, and then it's like a, a block, and you conduct all the block together. So you, you can use it repeatedly, you don't need just once. Yeah, but um, okay. Uh, and can it be a? I mean, but the benefit is to apply to just only one channel, but may maybe not one time, but maybe like one channel. Is that the the benefit, r real benefit behind this? Yeah, uh, the real benefit for. Sorry. Uh, let's say uh, let let me put it this way. Yeah. Um What if uh? W what will be the 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 difficulty if we don't do this. What would be the difficulty? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so think about that. If now your input is a handler channel, and uh, in the end you you do not want to keep off them, you want to reduce their size. So this is like the dense layer. You're trying to reduce the size of this handler probably to ten. Or sometimes you want to learn more channels with different kernels, and then. You have this turn input channels, and then you want to enlarge it to handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like um, the benefit is like you can learn more if you get much more channel, and uh, it's not as intermediate as much parameters at the dense layers. It just only have one by one. So you can see here we will have a six width here. But if you apply the MLP here, then it will be like uh, this nine twenty seven times. 18 weights, which is large weights, mm -hmm. but they're doing the same thing. I see. So can I say that it's similar to the compress from of the picture from like BMP bitmap to like JPEG, something like that? Mm -hmm. I mean, probably not exactly the same, but kind of the same, similar. Uh, can, can I'm I say not quite sure what, what does it do, uh, uh, but I can talk about it later. I'm not quite sure the oh, yeah. compression That's that right. you're talking. Okay, and when you say that uh, the number of channels, because uh, I'm not sure if, because I was trying to map it with uh, channels in graphic design. Like mm -hmm. usually we have like uh, RGB, so yeah. each channel. Like, so the max that from what I know of is like just only three. So, but you're saying that we have like hundreds of channels. So I'm just curious, like, uh, yeah, is that the same mapping or, uh, or the probably the same um, the. the is probably the the same terminology but different context. Uh, I'm I'm not quite sure uh, how to map the RGB to other different channels, but I guess it should have the same intuitions. Um, but it's just like we want to learn more features from different uh, kernels because they are edge kernel horizontally, vertically. Um, it's like different type of kernels that we can learn for these pictures, and we want to keep all the features result. Yeah, <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm not sure you. whether I answer your question or not. Okay, that's fine. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so okay, sure. So, shall we have the break now, or I I'm not quite sure. Yeah, um, yeah, let's finish the polling layer um, before the laynet. It won't be too long, okay? Okay, so we I only have five slides for you now. So really quick, you will have your break. <laughs> so polling, where are we using that? 
Um, it's like the uh, convolutional layers. It will just slide through your input mat matrix. And um, whatever you're doing, it's like we're trying to get the max or average value within the square matrix. So for example, your input is 0, 1, 3, 4 here, and you apply this 2 by 2 polling, which means that your square uh, slide kernel will be 2 by 2, and you extract only the max uh, atom format. So um, the first result will be 4 here, um, which is max 0, 1, 3, 4. And uh, similar uh, shape um, you will learn. And uh, why we're using pooling? It's super quick, um, super user friendly, because there's no learnable parameter. What do you need to do? You just need to si set the shape of this kernel size. It can be 2 by 2, 3 by 3, 5 by 5, etc. And uh, this pooling can be applied the similar padding and strat and the other convolutional layers. So you can think of this padding, uh, this pooling layer can be applied after a convolutional layer to reduce the size. For example, if you apply a two by two pooling, it will pull in like every like uh, within your squares to extract the um, most phenomenon features from the squares. And uh, please remember that for pooling, the output channel and the input channel is the same. So you apply the same pooling for every channel and uh, that's why it's the uh, same. So what's the difference between max pooling and average pooling? You can compare from this photo from left and right. On the left pooling have more bright and more difference between the white and um, the dark side and the bright side. And on the right hand side, it's more average out um, for within one squares. So that's the difference when you call the pooling with average and max. So max will capture the strongest um, pattern signal in the windows. And um, average, we're trying to capture the average signal for the windows. And that's why originally when people using average, like back in um, AlexNet, I believe, um, it's not that helpful. And then later, the advanced model with the used max pooling is much more help helpful yeah. to recognize the strongest element. Um, and uh, I will run the notebook uh, this afternoon um, after I demo how to install the on um, MXNet and every package on AWS EC2. So um, maybe after my lectures, after today and tomorrow, you guys can still run it with a hundred dollar credit. Yes. By the way, have anyone used AWS before? No? <laughs> okay, then I should definitely do that tutorial. Okay. So um, I guess we can.